Hey everyone, my name is Rush Shah, and I hope you are having a good day. I work as a senior solutions architect at Premier, and perhaps some of you know me from a previous round of webinars I have done on Netiza and self-service business intelligence. For those of you who are new, as a way of brief introduction, let me just say that I have 13 years of experience in business intelligence and enterprise data warehousing. I have a background in SQL Server, Oracle, Analysis Services, Cognos, Tableau, and MicroStrategy. And in my free time, you can find me reading or watching cinema. I'm an avid fan of the theater. And as everyone at Premier Connect Enterprise will vouch, you will find me obsessed about food just about all the time. So I'm recording, or pre-recording rather, today's webinar to introduce you to Hadoop in light of what we have discussed about Natiza in the last three webinars. Particularly, I want to talk about the architectural principles underlying them. What are the similarities between Hadoop and Natiza? And more importantly, what are the differences? Now, some of you may recall that we touched upon Hadoop in our first Natiza webinar, only to figure out that we had run out of time. And obviously, that Natiza webinar series has expanded to now this being the fourth. So you can imagine that we've covered a lot of ground, but we have always missed out on this comparison. Right? So the, this webinar should take about 30, 35, maybe at max 40 minutes. However, because it is being pre recorded, I'm hoping uh, that you'll be posting your questions on the Data Alliance Collaborative. Uh, Forum, and because you cannot really pose questions to me since it's pre recorded. So please try and go to the Data Alliance Collaborative Community and post your questions so that we can, we can answer them. We have a, a, depth, a lot of depth uh, in our team on uh, big data and how to do the implementation of big data. So uh, we should be able to answer your question, question to your satisfaction. So this webinar, we'll try to cover um, or introduce you to the concepts of Hadoop, the architectural principles underlying Hadoop, Hadoop's similarities with and divergence from Netiza. And at the outset, let me explain the reasoning behind this comparison. Massively parallel processing system uh, like Netiza, Teradata, and Greenflow, which implement and exemplify uh, the concepts of distributed computing, uh, are strikingly similar to Hadoop. All popular data appliances of the day have at their heart similar architectural principles in play, albeit with minor proprietary differences. So we're just going to take a look at some of these uh, and see how they compare. Now, any conversation on Hadoop, it seems, starts with some kind of an ad jingle on the three Ds. Everybody talks about the three Ds the volume, the variety, and the velocity of data in present-day information technology systems. Right? I like this infographic by Bipro, frankly, because it explains the meaning of the three Vs in context of data, but also in context of industries, and what is the potential value that can be determined or that can be leveraged if big data is successfully uh, managed and used in an in a, um, IT shop, right? So it is no secret that the volume of data being generated today is beyond the computing capacity of an organization, not literally, but metaphorically speaking. You may have the hardware and the software, but do you, do you have the know-how, the implementation required for it? At the heart of this problem is obviously not storage, right? Because storage is becoming cheaper by the day. It is not processing speed either, because now we are on the verge of having a supercomputer in an iPhone-like device. So part of the problem with the volume of data being generated is the heterogeneity, or the heterogeneous nature of this data. Data is being generated by people interacting with other people on the internet, right? So, for example, social and knowledge networks that we now have, like Facebook or like Premier Connect, for example, data is being generated by people interacting with these business applications, uh, like EHRs, lab and pharmacy systems, etc., and machines interacting with other machines, right? 
like GPS devices or health devices like Fitbit or Apple Watch. Another problem is that these devices are generating data at a speed that has hitherto been unforeseen. It is safe to say that perhaps the biggest challenge posed by big data or the three Vs is really the two other Vs, value and veracity. If so much data is being generated, stored, and consumed, then how do we manage to separate the signal from the noise? And how do we integrate and harmonize this data to rapidly discover actionable insights? A comprehensive answer to this would require us to engineer some kind of a balance between what Gartner has termed people, processes, and platforms. But the purview of this webinar is to talk about the technology or the platform-oriented solution to the problem of volume, variety, and velocity of data. So before we launch into a conversation on the traditional bottlenecks to big data, let me mention this in passing, that Hadoop and big data, although they sound synonymous today, do not mean the same thing. Big data is the phenomena or phenomenon of big volume, great variety, and high velocity of data generation in present day information technology ecosystems. Hadoop is the technology solution to efficiently leverage and effectively manage big data. So to put this in perspective, data appliances like Netiza, Greenplum, and Teradata are also technology solutions to manage big data. So Hadoop is a newer, more sophisticated idea on how to manage big data. But they all are, in some sense, a way of managing and leveraging value out of big data. I, in other words, you know, we often think of data warehousing in terms of Kimball's method of data warehousing, a star schema, etc. But really, data warehousing is not necessarily only Kimball's method. Kimball's method is one expression, one manifestation of a data warehouse. Similarly, Hadoop is one manifested manifest solution of big data. So is Natiza and others. So some of you may remember that at the beginning of our first webinar on Natiza, we talked about the barriers and bottlenecks that necessitated a solution like Natiza. Well, we're echoing some of the same sentiments here. Right? Similarly, there's a need for a solution like Hadoop uh, from the threat of traditional systems being unable to process and leverage the seemingly crazy amounts of data that is being generated today. But it is customary to talk about internet giants like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, the number of transactions that they generate per second, the amount of data being generated by these organizations. It is equally important to recognize that even large healthcare systems with their disparity HR systems, lab, pharmacy, and decision support systems are capable of generating terabytes of data every month. Now, traditional distributed systems relied on the same old mantra of faster CPUs and bigger RAMs with humongous network attached storage or NAS drives, as you know them. But because of finite bandwidth, because the bandwidth speeds have not kept a pace with RAM speeds, we have the same old problem that we talked about during the Nafisa webinars. Data is copied from your NAS drive to the compute nodes at runtime. This is fine for relatively small amounts of data, but not so good for the large volumes of data required for analysis in the internet economy. So getting data to the CPU is the big bottleneck, the bandwidth bottleneck. So let's take a brief example of that, right? The fastest disk transfer rates today rarely exceed 100 megabytes per second. So the time taken to copy about 100 gigabytes of data to the CPU would be anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes, assuming there are few, if any, interruptions. 
Now, since most CPUs will be performing multiple compute tasks at the same time, and since most servers or CPUs will not have RAMs of 100 gigabytes on which uh, computations can be performed simultaneously, we know that the actual performance on 100 gigabytes of data would be far worse. So there is a need for a new solution that not just solves the problem of analyzing data, but also addresses the problem, or large volumes of data, but also addresses the problem of data corruption, system failures, and accommodates the system for future growth and necessities. Here are a few things that a new approach would require, essentially in our present-day IT ecosystems. Notice that we are echoing some of the same principles that we highlighted in the Medita webinars. Failures of components should not result, in, should result in graceful decline of performance, and they should not result in system failures. They should not require system reboots, right? This is one of the central principles for any new solution in the new era. Right? Failed components or fault tolerance is the central idea here. The failed component should be able to rejoin the system upon recovery automatically, plug and, pay, or plug and play. Component failures should not affect the outcome of a job running on a system. In other words, issues like data loss, data corruption, and failed components should not bring the system to a Rather other, functioning, rather, other functioning components of the system should resume the work. Increasing system resources that support increased load capacity and performance agility, right? So, increasing resources should also automatically increase our capacity uh, for performance should increase the load capacity of the system. Scaling up and scaling out should not pose major problems and should not require system reboots or system stops. That these are important. Scalability, fault tolerance, system recoverability. In order to facilitate such a solution, Google did a lot of work in the late 1990s and it is based on their work that we now have the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, it is based on the work that was done in late 1990s, specifically on Google file system and map reviews. Hadoop is an open source software project overseen and anchored by the Apache Software Foundation. It's the same Apache Foundation that uh, anchors the web servers, the open source web servers that almost 70% of organizations in the world use. It is written entirely in Java, and the core concepts of Hadoop, like a Hadoop file system and MapReduce, mimic the Google file system and MapReduce proposed in the original papers. Now, Hadoop ecosystem includes uh, more than 30 uh, projects uh, being anchored by the Apache Software Foundation. We know these we know that these projects are increasing all the time, but some of the famous ones are Pig, Hive, HBase, Bloom, and Fusi. Now, to think of a Hadoop system, think about a cluster. So a set of machines running HDFS and MapReduce are known as clusters, and the individual machines in that cluster are known as nodes. A Hadoop system can comprise of tens or hundreds or thousands of nodes. Uh, it is a hardware agnostic approach. Hadoop is a completely software driven approach, right? So it is a cluster of computers in a grid, and each node is a combination of your CPU, RAM, storage. You can think about it in terms of a machine or a computer. You can also think about it in comparison to Netiza spoof, right? So it is similar to a spoof. A node is a spoof in some ways. Another important thing to remember here is the principles that we discussed in the TISA webinars, especially on the core concepts of distribution, remain the same in Hadoop. Absolutely, essentially the same. 
data is distributed as it is initially stored in the system based on a key on the Hadoop cluster at the node level. Processing of data is local. It occurs right at the node in which the data is stored. An inter-node conversation is kept to the minimum. So this is similar to the teaser's shared nothing architecture. Right? Same data is replicated several times on the system for increased availability and reliability. Right? So again, that supports fault tolerance. So we see some of the same concepts, but we are also seeing a divergence. The most important divergence is it is a software-driven approach. It is a loosely coupled architecture. If you remember in Netiza, we kept on harping in our first webinar that Netiza is a tightly integrated architecture. It is not a loosely coupled architecture. Netiza's argument is similar to the argument of Apple, where everything is tightly, the hardware and the softwares are tightly integrated. Netiza is the same way, whereas Hadoop, which is a manifestation of Google's approach to everything, is really a software-driven approach. And any commodity hardware can be taken and incorporated into a Hadoop cluster. So let us briefly look at how Hadoop works, right? The HDFS or Hadoop file system is responsible for stable data on the cluster. And so when the data is loaded onto the system, it splits it into massive blocks of 64 to 125 megabytes, megabytes of data. Now data is distributed across multiple nodes in the cluster based on the distribution scheme. Each block is replicated multiple times. Typically in Hadoop, data is replicated at least three times on three different nodes. Now MapReduce is the software used for processing data on the Hadoop cluster. It consists of two phases, the map phase and the reduce phase. And between the two stages, there's another stage called the shuffle and sort stage or phase. Each map task operates on a discrete portion of the data set. Only after all the map tasks are completed, the map reduce system distributes intermediate data to the nodes for reduced tasks. The master program in some ways is allocating the work to the nodes and tens or hundreds of thousands of nodes are working in parallel, each on their own discrete data set. This allows massively parallel processing, as you can see already, right? So typically, a Hadoop system will try and perform the math tasks on data stored locally on the node through the HDFS. If this is not possible, the map tasks will have to transfer data across the network as it processes. When the map tasks are accomplished, data is transferred across the network to the reducers for the reduced processes. Now, all map tasks in general have to communicate to all reduced tasks to send them process data. The reduced tasks may run on the same physical machines as the map tasks. However, there is no concept of data locality for reducers for them to remember. In practice, right, reduced tasks cannot begin until all map tasks have been completed. However, data can be transmitted to reduced tasks even while the last members are trying to finish their task. But the reduced tasks definitely cannot begin until all intermediate data is transferred and sorted. Now, in order to support fault tolerance, the master program will always try to detect any node failures in the Hadoop cluster. And it will reassign the work being performed by the failed node to a different node in the system. Restarting a task will not require communication with other nodes working on other portions of the data. If a, no, if a failed node restarts, it will automatically be added back to the system. If a node appears to be running slowly, the master program can redundantly execute another instance of the same task. This is known as speculative execution. Right? The results of speculative execution 
will be taken from whichever node finishes the task first. As far as the functionality of fault tolerance goes, these features exist in data appliances like Nantisa, Tenor, and Infinity. What does not exist is the concept of speculative execution. The idea that if one node is going slow, let's perform the task of that node. Perform the task of that node by assigning it to another node. That does not exist. Now the Hadoop software architecture comprises of five different background processes which are not accessible to the end user. But these are background processes that it is important to know in order to understand the Hadoop software architecture. Right? These background processes are typically in your computing systems known as daemons. So there are five different daemons in Hadoop. Name node, secondary name node, data node, job tracker, and task tracker. They each run in their own Java virtual machines. They can all run on a single physical box like your laptop or your desktop, but typically you want distributed computing. You want to run these processes in different machines. And typically that's how it's configured. They're all running uh, different machines. So what is a name node? A name node is similar to what, uh, what is being done by our SMP host in Nantisa. It holds the metadata for your Hadoop file system. Think of it in terms of the system catalog of the database. Now, secondary name node is a bit of a misnomer. It's not a failover. It's not meant for fault tolerance. It's not a hot standby for the name node. The secondary name node actually performs some secondary housekeeping functions for the name. And there is work being going on for a failover on the name node, but at this point, there's a single point of failure. Data node is invoked when data is loaded or generated in the system for storing data blocks. The job tracker daemon will manage and distribute uh, map reduce jobs. These jobs are then broken down into specific map shuffle and sort and reduce tasks uh, which are being managed and monitored by the task tracker. So Hadoop cluster is really works on a master slave architecture, master nodes, slave nodes architecture. These nodes uh, fall into two different categories. The master nodes are running one and only one instance of name node, secondary name node, and job tracker software processes. Whereas the slave nodes uh, are the ones that run at each node or each machine in your Hadoop cluster. And each of them runs data node and task tracker daemons. So each machine which is designated as a slave node will run both of these daemons. Now let's do a little bit of a brief comparison between Hadoop and Nantisa. I have personally chosen a few concepts on which to do this comparison. By no means uh, is this the only way of expressing or manifesting the concepts of Hadoop and Nantisa. Uh, you can do that in a variety of different ways, but I have chosen some which I think are important to give us a perspective of what are the similarities and differences between Hadoop and Nantisa. This will help us summarize what we have discussed thus far. Take, for example, BI tool integration, right? So Natiza, obviously, any BI tool that or version of the tool that has come out in the last 10 years, um, Natiza, it can access Natiza, basically. Whereas when it comes to Hadoop, um, it's only been popular over the last three, four years. So the adoption of Hadoop uh, is improving gradually and steadily for all newer versions of leading BI tools. Um, for example, Cognos has been, Cognos MicroStrategy have been supporting it since uh, 2012. Tableau has been supporting it since 2010, et cetera. Uh, older versions of this same software, MicroStrategy 8, Cognos 8, do not support it. Uh, client interaction. So Hadoop has this unique thing where clients can directly communicate with data nodes without any intermediation through the name node, which is in your master you know, which is a process in your master node. Whereas in Natiza, all communication has to go through your master 
or SMB host. Now, both Hadoop and NetEase implement a clustered file system. Uh, Hadoop's cluster file system is much bigger as we saw 64 to 128 megabytes. Uh, NetEase is probably smaller. It's based on um, the Postgres database file system. It's an enhanced modified version of it. Both Net, uh, Hadoop and NetEase perform column, column or columnar compression. Right? Hadoop's compression is even greater than NetEase's compression. Neither of them support row-based compression. Columnar tables, now this has become a hot ticket item over the last few years, last three or four years. Uh, we have seen that columnar databases are outperforming any row-based databases. Um, and you see dramatic uh, performance improvements. And uh, the Hadoop ecosystem, there are several ways of creating this. Uh, columnar tables. The one that we use in Premiere is the parquet files, which are columnar uh, style tables. Um, Nakiza does not support columnar tables yet, and this is a big drawback because over the last few years we have seen columnar tables, as I said, outperform row based tables, and uh, we've seen that even in the IBM um, offerings, the DB2 Blue offering. Which has come out recently last year outperforms the uh, outperforms the teaser. At least that's what a lot of uh, the buzz has been all about. So we're hoping that the teaser will adopt this uh, in future. We've seen other data appliances like Greenplum already adopt this. Vertica is completely based on this columnar table concept. So hoping that this should come into the teaser in future operations. But it's a it's definitely a drawback not to have. Data co-location, right? Now, this is the idea of uh, not only co-locating uh, data from two different tables, but also performing its uh, uh, processing, or query processing at the local at uh, the local nodes level, right? So this is uh, the entire point of it. But this has not yet come about in Hadoop. So this is a serious drawback on the Hadoop side. But I think there are. A lot of papers that are being constantly submitted and a lot of work is going on in Hadoop to implement data co-location. It's probably a couple of years out, but uh, it's definitely something that needs to happen in Hadoop ecosystem in order for it to be real-time report-ready system. Data distribution, both Nadeza and Hadoop work on the concept of uh, distributing data in a similar fashion without hidden access. Data integrity, NetEase is fully uh, ACID uh, fully implements ACID or atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability principles uh, of a database. Now, what do these principles mean? In brief, uh, if you have a database in which data is being written by applications into the database, and then there are other applications which are retrieving data from that same database at the same time, right? In a concurrent manner, data is being written, data is being retrieved uh, by different applications and different users at the same time. Uh, there is a potential of a conflict. In order to resolve this conflict, there are principles that are encoded in the software of the database system, right? To manage the integrity of the data. These are highlighted by atomicity, uh, consistency, isolation, and durability principles. It is as fully uh, implemented all the principles of ACID. Hadoop requires some additional configuring on it to become ACID compliant. Data restructured, but it's automatic in Hadoop. It's, it will require some grooming for data defragmentation, as we've seen before. Now, flash memory is not a point of comparison for most people, but I really like it because obviously flash memory performs better than any other type of hardware storage. Uh, Hadoop is a hardware agnostic uh, solution and therefore implements or can implement any kind of uh, memory, any kind of uh, any kind of storage system. But Nagisa cannot. It comes, it's an appliance. It comes built in with the kind of uh, storage system that it has. And it does not at present offer flash memory in its storage. I do can use any kind of commodity hardware, any kind of hardware. It's completely hardware agnostic, whereas Nadeza has both 
by any hardware. So it also makes things a bit more expensive because in Adobe you can use any kind of hardware. Again, high availability features uh, exist in both Matiza and uh, Hadoop. However, it's important to realize that Hadoop does have um, a single point of failure in its name node, and that can be catastrophic. It would require a manual failover would require a manual system reboot uh, for the name node processes on the master node. In Netiza, uh, failover or fault tolerance built into every aspect of the system, and there is no single point of failure. Even the uh, master host or node. The SFD host uh, have a uh, hot standby to the interconnect, right? So uh, Hadoop and Natiza both have a pretty robust um, fiber optic bandwidth that connects all of the nodes or SKUs in its cluster or in its appliance. But uh, Hadoop, being hardware agnostic, can move beyond a 10 gigabit internet bandwidth, right? It can go up to 40, 50, whatever you have right now. Whereas Natiza comes built in with a 10 gigabit Ethernet bandwidth. Uh, master node in Hadoop is known as the name node. In Natiza is known as uh, the SFP host. Right? It performs um, all kinds of um, cataloging tasks, uh, query planning tasks, um, uh, query scheduling tasks. And in both cases, it's the same. But in the case of Hadoop, as we have mentioned before, master node is a single point of, uh, it's a single point of failure. And whereas in Natiza, there's a hot standby for the master node. Uh, Hadoop has uh, some amount of OS flexibility. You can use any kind of uh, Unix-based operating system. You might even in future see Windows-based operating systems being used for Hadoop. Uh, in Natiza, uh, uses Linux-based operating system. comes built in into the appliance. Replication, both implement uh, uh, both replicate data to support uh, data failures. Hadoop stores three copies of data, whereas Matiza maintains two copies of data through built in memory. Scalability Hadoop allows for scaling out and scaling up, whereas Matiza only allows uh, scalability to scaling out. And there are limits to it. If the rack, all the racks in Matiza appliance gets filled up, you cannot scale out. So there are some limitations to scalability in Matiza. Skill requirements. Now, this is very important because Hadoop is a new uh, ecosystem that's coming into the data ecosystem that's coming into the market. So, right, uh, it requires a lot of training for, to, for the existing staff to understand uh, Hadoop and to leverage and deploy Hadoop based applications. Uh, whereas Matiza is really data warehousing for dummies, all you need is an understanding of SQL. And then you need a little bit of more understanding on that Jesus core concept. But having known that, you can then devote most of your time in um, solutioning uh, rather than configuring for performance. Slave nodes in Hadoop are known as data nodes. Uh, and in Natiza, they are known as spools, and they both perform uh, tasks that are equivalent. Uh, in Hadoop, they perform map reduce tasks. In Natiza, they perform uh, query processing tasks. Storage. Uh, so both Natiza and Hadoop being uh, distributed systems, they have direct uh, attached storage, and that's what's recommended. However, a lot of vendors uh, have now started supporting network attached storage for Hadoop. Uh, because it is hardware agnostic, so you could technically do that, but I suppose that that would um, create a problem for uh, distributed computing because you would not be able to do some parallel processing as you want with the network attached storage. Uh, another feature of Hadoop is that storage is in finite gain span. You can add, keep on adding more nodes, and that would automatically add more storage. In Nagisa, that is limited petabytes, the biggest, largest Natiza system available out there, Natiza appliance available out there, can only expand petabytes of data. So that's uh, a comparison between Hadoop and Natiza. I hope that has helped you guys uh, understand what are the similarities and differences between Natiza. Obviously, people who are comfortable with the idea of uh, distribution uh, 
will very immediately understand how the tool works, how parallel processing will work. Uh, I hope it helps you a lot, and I hope you guys, um, I encourage you guys to go and post your questions uh, on Hadoop. We have a big team, as I said, in Premier Connect Enterprise that's working on Hadoop implementation right now for our community healthcare project, and they would love to answer questions on this. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.